The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. I'm DJ Heckes, CEO of Exhibit Trade Show Marketing Experts and author of Full Brain Marketing and co-author of The Noise Behind Business, How to Make Trade Shows Work. Today is a great day if you set a goal to be more innovative in your marketing. So welcome to The Noise Behind Business, How to Make Trade Shows Work for You in 2014. You may be asking why the noise behind business in a world where virtual has come to mean everywhere, and online means everyone. When you exhibit at a trade show, there's so much noise in business that it's easy to lose track of your message and connect with your audience. That's why the Noise Behind Business title came about, and today we'll elaborate on the importance of buyers meeting sellers face-to-face. -face. If you have any questions throughout this webinar today, please be sure to type in your questions and I will look at them in with, in with Laura, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So trade shows and exhi exhibitions give business a wealth of new opportunities, because as it states in the book, innovation is truly a contact sport. So in the world of trade shows, it's an industry and profession with global impact, but it's also absent of definitive books and webinars to make trade shows work until now. The Noise Behind Business, How to Make Trade Shows Work is the right book with webinar trainings like this that we're doing today at the right time. So you may ask, well, why? It's because students are graduating from universities today with marketing degrees and they need a resource to understand the role of trade shows and how to develop a strategy to achieve business objectives. Trade show managers are challenged to op optimize their program's performance or risk losing budget and position. Marketing managers are also recognizing that face-to-face -face is preferred to business-to-business, -to -business, also known as B2B, and buyers and to think more strategically about how trade shows integrate into their marketing mix. Sales managers are realizing that trade show selling is not field selling, and exhibit staff training is not an option but a necessity. Exhibitions give business a wealth of new opportunities because as you will learn and understand in this webinar today, Innovation is a contact sport. Now I'd like to introduce you to my co-trainer, Laura Furamoto. Thanks, DJ. According to a recent white paper, How Smart CMOs Accelerate Revenue with Events, right now customers, your customers, are doing most of their navigation through the purchase process without a company even realizing they're a prospect due to the unlimited supply of information online and through social media connections. Think about it. How did you hear about this webinar today? How do most of your companies, customers find you? How do you get them in front of you in an event environment where you can nail down a critical acceleration point and secure a competitive advantage? We're going to show you how. This is the first in our four-part webinar series for 2014. Today's program is designed to help you understand why trade shows are essential to your marketing mix. But before we get started, there are just a couple of housekeeping points that we need to cover. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please contact GoToWebinar Tech Support at 855-352-9003. Be sure to jot down notes and ideas today on your how-to guide, but don't worry about copying every slide. You'll receive an email from us in a couple of days with a link to a download with this presentation in a PDF format. And lastly, you're welcome to submit questions like DJ said online throughout the presentation. Simply click on the Q&A panel in the upper right corner of your screen, type your question in the text box, and click Submit. We'll do our best to address as many questions as possible in the Q&A segment at the end of the program. So now that we've got the details out of the way, let's focus. You've got a choice, innovate or die. Let's start living and winning new customers. In today's webinar, you'll learn why buyers and sellers collide successfully at trade shows, why you should trust trade shows for your innovation, how to leverage the power of the trade show ecosystem, we'll give you firm research statistics that will support your budget due diligence, and we'll show you 23 proven ways to use trade shows to better your business. 
Okay, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to provide the profile information during registration. I thought you'd be interested in general to know what today's group looks like. 12% of you come from the marketing industry, 12% in service, and the rest of the majority come from consulting, healthcare, software, computers, and manufacturing. 39% of our attendees have one to four employees, 24% have five to 10 employees, and the majority of the rest we are between 50 and 999 employees. 39% have between zero to $100,000 per year in gross revenue. 18% have between $100,000 and $499,000. 18% have between $500,000 and $1 million. And 18% have, um, excuse me, 9% have $5 million and above. Now, I thought this was really great. We have a nice balance between people who have not and have exhibited at trade shows before. And we're going to be able to help both of you with the information in this webinar. 33% have not participated in any trade shows. 27% between 1 and 5 trade shows. 9% between 6 and 10. 21% between 10 and 20 trade shows. And then 9% have, have participated in 20 or more trade shows. So we've got some veterans out there too, which is great. If you have participated in trade shows as an exhibitor, 36% have participated at the local level, 27% at national, 24% at regional, and we also have 12% who have participated in international shows as well. 55% of you are actually happy with the results of your trade show experience as an exhibitor so far. 21% no. And of course, we've got the 24% that haven't participated, so that's not applicable. Your biggest trade show challenges seem to be finding and meeting relevant and qualified leads that are the right demographic, how to break through clutter with the correct and accurate booth information, what to display and hand out, making sure it's relevant, following up to the show, following up after the show, and then cost justification and return on investment, and do you even know, need to go at all? And we'll help you answer that question today. Your biggest trade show triumph. Well, 24% of you say that gaining new clients is what you consider a triumph, whether they're contracts or bids. 18%, um, excuse me, 3% need inf more information on how to get the correct booth information out and have done that also, and at the same time we have a nice balance where that, that percentage also says that they have good information and that's been very effective for them. Other than making more contacts, um, a lot of people are just coming to us for some information because they've done very well and yet they need some innovative ideas. Now who coordinates trade show activity at your company? Well, 36% say mostly me, I'm it. So you might not have a trade show or event or marketing title, but you are responsible for the, web, for the trade show marketing. 33% say that your marketing manager handles it, and 24% say your sales manager handles it. And then 6% the special events manager handles all the trade show needs at your company. Now, let's take a look and see why you're here today and what your pressing issues are. Because we appreciate your time and responses because that enables us to tailor today's program to do your demographic. So let's go ahead and take a live poll. Go to the poll section of your panel and then answer the question or the statement above that best explains you today. First, you're looking to you're new to trade shows and you're looking to seek knowledge. Second, you need innovative and creative ideas. Third, you need an answer for management who is asking for budget justification for trade shows. Four, you need resources to improve your trade show presence. Or five, you want to increase your return on investment. So go ahead and take a minute to respond. Just Think about what best describes you today. Now, you could be one of or many of these statements today. You might need all of this information. We'll address everything.
throughout the webinar. I'm just trying to get an idea of what your immediate needs are. Okay, about 15 more seconds and we'll close the poll. Okay, super, let's close the poll. Thank you so much. Let's review the statistics. Okay, 38% of you say you need innovative and creative ideas. 25% of you want to increase your ROI. 25% of you need resources to improve your um, um, trade show presence. And then 13% of you are new to trade shows and you're seeking knowledge. That's great. Thank you so much for your responses. We'll, each, we'll address each of these areas today. And if you need more in-depth information, you can wait until the Q&A session at the end of the webinar or call and email us after the webinar itself. Great live survey information. Laura, thank you so much for sharing all those stats to help each of us know and understand what information is needed to be successful in trade show marketing. You know, according to Doug Ducate, he's the president and CEO of the Center for Exhibition Industry Research. He says exhibitions are the last bastion of face-to-face -face marketing. The, travel, the traveling salesman is a footnote of the last century. He also says as people want to be able to feel and touch and know the folks whom they are doing business with at ex exhibitions, and they want to have a place since they are by far the most efficient way to bring products to market. In a world increasingly dominated by bits of data and silently streaming through the World Wide Web, there's one industry, and that is the noise behind business, and that is trade shows. Step into any convention hall in the globe, and the noise is deafening of business. From the hum of forklifts and workers and creating a mini city of exhibits atop a concrete floor to exhibitors demonstrating their latest gadgets. Silence is not in the trade show lexicon, nor has it ever been. It's an industry that's evolved from ancient street markets where barter and trading were animated and loud. This is as true today as it was then. But the difference is scale. Trade shows contribute $106 billion to the U.S. GDP today, making it one of the nation's largest industries and the noise behind business. Trade shows also bring together buyers and sellers around the globe to find and deepen business connections, see and introduce new products, develop new distribution channels and partners, recruit talent, research competition, network with peers, gain education, recharge motivation, and so much more. Perhaps more importantly, though, exhibitions help ring the cash register. I find it interesting to note that more than half of business travelers surveyed stated that 5 to 20 percent of their company's new customers were the result of trade show participation. So what business today needs most is to enrich relationships, nurture business communities, build commerce, and drive growth. In short, there's no better medium to do this than at trade shows. So that brings us to the next slide about there's three distinct opportunities for trade shows, trade fairs, and exhibitions. They're industry-centric. They're held at predictable and scheduled intervals. Intervals. They're attended exclusively by and for trade with the intent of taking orders of sample products at the, show, at the show or even after. They're also known as exhibitions organized so that companies in a specific industry can showcase and demonstrate their last products, their service, maybe study activities of rivals, and examine recent marketing trends and opportunities. I'd like to share with you the 10 most popular industry trade shows that were in 2013. You had the, in number one, was the Michigan Safety Conference in April. Number two, the National Green Building Conference and Expo in May in Philadelphia. Number three, National Lawn and Garden Show in June in Chicago. Number four, Plant Biology in July in Rhode Island. Number five, the World Expo 2013 Managed Print Summit in July in Las Vegas. Number six, Midwest Accounting and Finance Showcase in August in Rosemont, Illinois. Number seven, the World Energy Engineering Congress in September in Washington, D.C. Number eight was the annual NIC Conference in October in Chicago, Illinois. Number nine, 
was Ocean City Resort Gift Expo in November in Ocean City, California. And number 10 was the annual Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine World Congress in December in Las Vegas, Nevada. So be sure to go to your how-to guide and write the link shown on this slide to research shows by name, industry, country, region, and year to create your master trade show wish, wish list so you can start looking at exhibiting at. So that brings us to number two, exhibitions. Exhibitions are not industry centric. They're held at intervals with multiple products on display. They're attended by the public with the intent of sales promotion or nation building. By definition, an exhibition is a large public exhibition of art of trade goods. You'll see a lot more trade goods for promotion on sale on the show floor rather than seeing elaborate exhibits with branding. The focus more, is more on the products on display to the public. And then we'll go on to number three, which is conventions. Conventions are a formal assembly, typically uh, market-centric. They're a meeting or conference of people who share a common interest and or purpose and may or may not include an exhibit expo. I'd like to share with you the top 10 convention centers in the United States for 2013. In reverse order, number 10 is San Diego Convention Center. They have 615,700 square feet. Number 9, Anaheim Convention Center, 800,000 square feet. Number 8, Moscone Center in San Francisco, 700,000 square feet. Number 7, Phoenix Convention Center. 312,000 square feet. Number six, Georgia World Congress Center with 1.5 million square feet. Number five, Dallas Convention Center with 1 million square feet. Number four, Walter E. Washington Convention Center in D.C. They're undergoing expansion right now, so they're enlarging. Number three, Las Vegas Convention Center with 2 million square feet. And number two, McCormick Place in Chicago, 2.670 million square feet. And number one, Orange County Convention Center in Orlando, 2.1 million square feet. So about 50% of the largest 200 shows in the U.S. take place in just three cities, which are Las Vegas, Chicago, and Orlando. The source for this information is the Trade Show News Network, also known as TSNN.com. Thanks, BJ. With all those millions of square feet, somebody's got to be making somewhere with trade shows. And they trust trade shows for their sales and marketing. So why should you trust trade shows for your innovation? Well, historically, the best innovators have turned to trade shows. Think about the three most innovative technologies that you use every day that were introduced to the market in the last five years. How have they changed your life? I bet they were introduced at a trade show. Let's check it out. The inventors of these products trusted introduction via trade shows. Take a look at this list. How many products do you use on a daily basis? We've got PC, well, we've got email, mobile phone, DNA testing, microprocessors, fiber optics, non-invasive surgery, liquid crystal displays and GPS systems. But when I look at the list, I've used pretty much everything but the MRI and the laparoscopic surgery, but I might in the next couple of years all of these items were introduced at a trade show. So if you really think about what you're doing at a trade show, you actually have the power to influence how we live every minute, depending on what your products and services are. Here's an additional list. How many of these do you use every day? How many of you could go back to living without online shopping? Do you even remember how to access cash before the arrival of ATMs? And what would shopping be like without barcodes or scanners? A little slower, right? All these were introduced at a multitude of trade shows. Now we're going to show you the power of a single show. These products were introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, in the last five years. In fact, CES just took place um, a couple of weeks ago. OLED TV in 2008, 3D HDTV, HDTV in 2009, tablets, netbooks, and Android devices, connected TV, smart appliances, Android Honeycomb, Ford's Electric Focus, 
Motorola Atrix, Microsoft Avatar Connect, Ultrabook, Android, Ultra HD TV, driverless car technology. We've been seeing a lot of that in the press lately, and Lego Mindstorm. Now, let's look at your results for innovation in the last five years and see if they've been on these lists. I bet they have. Now, of course, the CES show involves major consumer electronics companies with lots of research and development budgets. However, the everyday entrepreneur wanting to bring a product to market and any size company can use the power of trade shows and the concentrated focus groups they provide to have a hands-on experience with their products and services. Well, what will you trust to trade shows? Go to your how-to guide distributed upon registration. Write down three things that you could teach current customers and prospects through a trade show. Now, these could be ideas that you've had drawn out on a napkin. Perhaps you've been looking for an innovative way to bring them to life. Or they could be brand new products in beta form, but now you want to test them. These could be new versions of your current software or maybe a new customer app, but you want feedback before making them final. So name three things that you can envision and commit to paper right now. Thanks, Laura. I love the action steps. Remember, this is about engaging you and getting it from your perspective. Please be sure to fill out those questions so we can answer at the end as we go along. So I wanted to share with you some great resources that you may want to keep in mind. The first one is the Center for Exhibition Industry Research, also known as CEIR. This is the best source for trade show, research. Some articles are free. Others are at a cost. But what I love about this site, it has a free ROI tool. Remember, many of you ask for ROI on your trade shows. Take advantage of that. Then you have the Exhibitor Magazine. It's a great source for educating, including uh, design trends, tips, and peer experiences. You have the Event Marketer Magazine. It's a great source for corporate meeting and event planners. Exhibit and Event Marketers Association. This is a great source for education and information, and it's www.e2ma.org. Some online sources of exhibit industry news would include the ones listed, like tsnn.com, exhibitcitynews.com, trade-show-expo.com, eventsinamerica.com, conventions.net, trade-show-advisor.com. So for more white papers, blogs, and additional free information, download the link on the bottom of this, this slide that says exib-it.com forward slash white hyphen papers. We have a lot of free download tools to help you become successful exhibitors with an ROI mentality. So then we move on to the attendees. 81% of trade show attendees have buying authority. Now, Laura, I know you have some more information on that. What do you think about that? Thanks, DJ. Well, they do. Most of the, most of the trade show's attendees, so 81%, four out of five people walking the aisles are potential customers for exhibitors. That's from CEIR, the SPIN decision, analyzing how exhibits fit into the overall marketing budget. 99% of marketers said they found unique value from trade shows they did not get from other marketing mediums. The three most valued in aspects of trade shows were 60% of exhibitors said they value the ability to see lots of prospects and customers at the same time. 51% of exhibitors said they value face-to-face -face meetings with prospects and customers. 47% said they value the ability to meet with a variety of players face-to-face, -face, such as customers, suppliers, resellers, etc. And that's according to CEIR. The, the above-mentioned study shows that 85% of the companies surveyed through Center for Exhibition, Exhibition Industry Research will either participate in the same number of trade shows as last year or plan to increase their participation in trade shows. Statistically, this stacks the deck in your favor. In other words, if you've been wanting to exhibit, the likelihood that your customers, potential customers, and competitors will be at a show is high. This survey also reveals that attendance quality of an exhibition is the most prevalent factor driving the decision to exhibit at 84%. Favorable return on investment, 
and positive past performance 50% are the next most common factors considering when deciding to participate in an event. Oh, I've got a question here. Um, let's see, that people are not understanding where to download the how-to guide. The guides were embedded in your reminder and confirmation email. So if you want to just switch screens real quick and click back on that link, that would be great. If not, don't worry about it, and you know, just take a piece of paper and you know, do a do a makeshift one real quick, or whatever you guys decide. But I wanted to make sure and address that question before we moved on. Now, attendees, based on all these statistics, the point that we want to drive home is this: attendees want to go to trade shows, and they are looking for you. So let's give you some more due diligence support. Eight out of ten business executives prefer in-person contact to virtual, according to a Forbes Insight study of 760 business executives. The most frequently cited reasons include building a stronger, more meaningful business relationship, ability to read body language and facial expressions, and more social interaction and ability to bond with coworkers and clients. This was also confirmed in a recent CIR study saying the role and value of face-to-face -face interaction. The top three sales-related objectives at trade shows are related to relationship management and engagement. Above all else, exhibitors want to meet with existing customers, key customers, and prospective customers. The exhibition setting continues to deliver high value to, to buyers and sellers in achieving targeted business results. In other words, those sweet spots for the most important face-to-face -face interactions are both the pre-purchase and maintaining relations relationships in the post-purchase phases, and trade shows do all three. You can hit pre-show, at-show, and post-show in your marketing strategy by using trade shows. Part of our purpose today is to empower you to make the right trade show decisions, because there are a lot of decisions to make when you're involved in trade shows. It's for our, those folks in our audience who have never been there before. And for those that have, you know that that's often the truth. Understanding the big picture is key. Now, we're going to talk about the elements of a trade show ecosystem because they all work together. Just like any other ecosystem, it includes all living things in the given area that is interacting with each other and also with their non-living environment. The trade show ecosystem is no different. By understanding the importance of each component, You'll be a more informed trade show consumer and understand how to leverage all the ecosystem's attributes to your advantage. This graphic depicts the U.S. ecosystem. Now, trade show ecosystems have many variables and has grown and evolved over time to support 11,000 trade shows in the U.S. alone per year. There are 30 per day, averaging 48,000 square feet of exhibition space per show. The largest percentage of shows are hosted by hotels at 44%, while convention centers host 37%. As we go through the elements of the ecosystem, I'm going to highlight some of the areas that can surprise the first-time trade show attendee and give some hints at cost savings. For example, if you participated and have not participated in a trade show before, you may be surprised to know that labor might have to set up your booth, depending on the complexity or other trade show vendors might have to do things that you were thinking you would be doing yourself and now are at a cost. So that's one of those things to think about. And one of the things you might not know if you haven't attended a trade show before. So for attendees, exhibitors, and show organizers, also known as show owners, and general contractors, they provide labor or labor management. In the ebook or hard copy book that you'll receive as an attendee in the webinar, it goes into much more detail on all of these elements of the, of, of the ecosystem. Now, we also have hotels, including food and beverage, the visitor and convention bureaus, which are very competitive in terms of getting um, contracts for big conventions into their cities. As you can imagine, the hundreds of thousands of dollars or even multiple millions of dollars that can come into a city for trade shows. Exhibit companies that are not only your trade show display partners, but are also can, can be consultants and help you with cost savings as well, and act as your partner in your exhibit experience. Advertising, marketing, and PR agencies that help develop your brand and your representation at the trade show. 
speakers that provide content. Now, if you're an industry expert or have an innovative idea that could turn your industry up on its ear, you can actually apply to become a speaker at one of the trade shows that you exhibit. It's a great way to develop credibility and PR for your company. We also have exhibitors, over 1 million exhibitors, and attendees at over 80 million. Now, TJ, it's really important, and I know you have a lot of examples, about understanding how all these elements can work for you or against you, which is the reason why trade show planning is so important. You know what? You're so right. Um, everything involved in your trade show presence has a cost associated with it as well as the need to follow a particular trade show rules and specifications. For example, I have a customer that we sold a double deck display to, and in October they had the Solar Power International Global Show in Chicago. Now when they were preparing for their double deck, it was interesting because about four to six months before the show, they had to contact the show manager, get permission, and send all the engineer drawings to get approved. Just because you buy a double deck display doesn't mean you can exhibit with it at a display, at a show. So think about the prerequisites needed. Find out the show regulations. Also, I have another customer that's going to the Heli Expo in February, and we just did a beautiful nomadic display, 20 by 20 design line for them. We're shipping it today, as a matter of fact, and it's going to Anaheim. And what they're doing is they're having three different shipments come in at the show. So think about all the material and handling in the show services cost. A lot of you, you know, probably have experienced this, some may not, but when you ship things to the show, there's a choice to ship to the advanced warehouse and there's a choice to ship direct to the show. Now, it's very important that you're aware of the timelines. Sometimes it's cheaper to ship to the advanced warehouse and sometimes it's not. At the Heli Expo, it's not, but we're still doing it because you have a month timeline to get everything there. And they get precedence to get to your booth space at a larger show first. When you ship to the dock, you have to wait for the trucks and the unloading. And you may, not, you may have to wait on your labor team if you hired labor at a certain time. Your booth may not be there when you expect it. So these are all the anomalies that you want to know when you're getting ready for the show. Another thing is they have three different shipments coming in. So think about all the charges. Most shows uh, at a larger one might have a 200 pound uh, minimum. So when you ship something, even if it's an overnight package and it could weigh 14 pounds, you're going to get charged that 200 weight cost in the handling fee. So those are all the things that we can teach you even on more webinars about the show costs and savings. And I do see the questions lining up and I want each of you to know that we will be addressing those. So I love seeing the questions come in. There's, you know, there's tips and tricks of the trade that can also reduce costs and headaches up front if you're in the planning stages. In our April 22nd webinar called Selecting the Right Show, How Due Diligence Pays Off, we'll have a budget checklist download to help you plan and organize costs for your next trade show. Remember from your grade school days, each element in the ecosystem relies on the others for survival. The same goes here for trade shows. Thanks, DJ. Every ecosystem evolves, and the trade show system is no ecosystem is no different. When we're considering planning for our company and the different marketing tools that we use, including trade shows, anticipating events for the future are, is really important. Will digital communications such as texting and social media replace the need to hear a voice and see a face? Are trade shows in danger of being replaced by these current and future technological developments? Well, not likely. DJ and I have talked about this quite a bit. And our opinion is also shared by Daniel Burris, considered one of the world's leading technological forecasters, innovation speaker, and author of six books, including Technotrends. He says, even though in the future we'll have more and more technology in our lives, we need to always remember that we live in a human world. And that means creating positive relationships will increasingly be a key to success. Trade shows have a bright future because they are all about establishing new relationships and reinforcing old ones. New studies suggest that the phenomena of ever-increasing information overload and ever-shortened business cycles has made the human attention span a limited resource. I know this just for myself. I mean, all the emails that we face every day and social media, a majority of the people now get their news through social media. 
which is a huge difference from just 10 years ago or even five years ago. So that limited resource is really stretched at this point. Trade shows promote a more focused attention, effective engaged learning, and a novel multi-sensory experience that is difficult to achieve through virtual mediums. You were made for relationships and human interaction. Think of it like this. In the day of GoToMeeting and Skype, today airlines are more full than ever before. In this day of high-definition interactive TV, seeing professional sports live continues to attract major attendance. Clearly, online tools are valuable and certainly have a place, a growing place, in business today. But even with these wonderful tools, nothing replaces just being there. Ecosystems adapt to new realities every day. That the trade show ecosystem is no different. It will continue and does evolve and expand to enrich the visitor experience and optimize how buyers and sellers want to connect. In the book, it will detail how show managers, show producers, venues, hotels, convention bureaus, exhibiting marketing firms, and exhibitors are all adjusting to technology to enhance and enrich the customer experience on the trade show floor. Trade shows are not sales or marketing efforts. They're both to create success. They, most, they must be a sales and marketing effort now and in the future. So if we take a look at the trade show ecosystem slide of the future here, there's always going to be a place for the creative agency. There's always going to be a place for global solutions, both inbound and outbound, and for hybrid agencies, which are integrated and real and online that hold everything together. Think about the vision for your company. Where are you and where do you want to go, and how do trade shows fit in your future? Thanks, Laura. Now that's the macro about trade shows. Now let's talk a little bit micro about the inside reality of our companies. You know, trade shows do many things well throughout the company's life cycle. So I like to call this the yellow brick road, the best traveled road for marketing success. Deciding what marketing strategies are best for a company can be overwhelming. Determining and knowing what stage of business is in can help define how and where to get started with marketing strategies to grow your business. When times are tough, we feel challenged. No matter how much we try to seek a standardized solution for running a successful business through exhibiting at trade shows, every business runs based on individual perspectives and principles, which need not always be similar. In general, businesses experience one or more of these five stages. Let's start with the first. This is where a lot of planning goes into building the business from concept. You want to research trade shows, and it's more strategic to define your marketing segments and know which target audience you want to focus on. Depending on your industry, I'd focus on local and regional to start with for the branding process of your company name for exposure. Number two is what I call growth mode. Once the business passes the startup and transitions into the growth blossoming phase, it begins to find core customers. This is also when the business establishes its niche in the market. This is a phase where the business starts to establish brand identity and generate brand loyalty with the customer base, and you use sound marketing practices. You want to research trade shows more by niche marketing where it becomes the focus. Then you move on to the expansion stage. This is a stage that business continuity and sustainability is happening. The decision facing businesses now becomes whether to exploit the company's accomplishments and expand or keep the company stable and profitable. Decisions should be made more to use the company as a platform for growth and possibly franchise out or build additional offices in other regions. Now the focus becomes regional versus local and most likely national. Maturity stage, number four. This is the stage where it's the essence stage for a business that can reach this level. It, be, it comes from hard work, focus, and drive, with one eye on the financial side of the business and the other eye on the marketing side. During this stage also, a company needs to focus on building value for its customers, and it usually has established overall company excellence. Continuous innovation is a must to stay in this business stage. You'll want to attend trade shows and probably expand and do all of them. You probably already have a good local and regional presence, you're looking at national, and some of you even, I think it was 13% globally. This is where you want to maintain your presence and your company brand. Growth may not be the focus, and it may be more for sustainability. Number five is the transition stage. 
This is where a company may decide to sell, purchase a company, and grow, or merge with another company and may want visibility during this stage to increase your trade show presence with the transition stage. So no matter what stage of business you're in, exhibiting in trade shows plays a vital role for exposure for your company. So then we go on to the 23 proven ways for exhibiting success. I know Laura has a great story to introduce on this slide. Thanks, DJ. You know, I really like your growth mode slide and your explanation because no matter where you are in the life cycle of your product or your service or your company, we have 23 proven ways to exhibit for success. Now, there are several people that in the pre-registration process noted that they're really not sure why they go to trade shows. It might have been something that um, they, they inherited and it's something that they've always done, but maybe that they need to prove other ways to make return on investment or more, use trade shows more effectively. So here are the 23 proven ways that if you're questioning why you go to trade shows, maybe you're not doing all of these things and you could leverage these a little bit more successfully. So we've narrowed this list down to the top 23 for efficiency. As we go through the list, jot down some notes in your how-to guide about how you envision applying each one to your company today, especially if, not, if you've not been using any and are questioning your return on investment in trade shows in general. So the first one we've talked about in our research stats and due diligence stats, introducing new products. Innovation drives interest. The number one reason for attending not exhibiting trade shows is to see new products. 92% of trade show attendees say they are looking for new products. It's been the number one reason to attend for 25 years. So trade shows are a great place to introduce or feature your newest thing. And the source for that, I see a lot of questions um, looking for sources. Um, many of the sources of the statistics actually come from the book, the ebook that you um, have, can download and receive. This source is from CEIR, the role and value of face-to-face -face buyers. They want to kick the tires before they commit. Some trade shows showcase new products and services as many trade shows within a trade show. For example, at the Fancy Food Show, North America's largest specialty food and beverage marketplace since 1955, there's a special location for brand new products, which they also feature on their website so you can follow up afterwards on all the good ideas that you've seen. The number two reason for exhibiting at trade shows would be to build distribution. You can find new distribution channel partners, suppliers, manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, and online. Why? Well, what are your current goals? If you want to increase efficiency through lower cost of production, you can do that by finding new distribution partners. You can lower shipping costs through closer geographic proximity. Or what else are, is on your list? You can expand existing distribution partners through face-to-face -face relationship building, partnering on vision for the future, and securing longer-term contracts because you're going to see those people in person and be able to talk to them about the things that are most important to you and the things that are important to them. Maybe you've got some common ground in both the vision is for your company. Whether it's increasing your bottom line through new product volume and sales or more secure and efficient distribution, trade shows can do both. Thanks, Laura. So that brings us to number three, facilitating and nurturing relationships. Isn't that what it's all about? Do you exhibit in trade shows to see current customers, meet new ones, connect with suppliers, distributors, and media? Or maybe you want just to audit the competition. The relationship between business sales and trade show participation is particularly strong to accomplish all these things. Also, more than half of business travelers stated that 5 to 20 percent of their company's new customers were the result of trade show participation. That, that's pretty good stats, y'all. So then we go on to number four, generating qualified leads. The average salesperson visits 2.7 prospects per day or has 675 face-to-face -face meetings per year. Now, this is based on an optimum schedule of 50 weeks. Compared to lead generation from a trade show, where you can capture that same, or the same numbers in a few days. Further, 48% of exhibiting leads don't even require a sales call to close the deal. Here's a fact. 67% of all attendees represent a new prospect, 
and potential customer for exhibiting companies. This means that trade shows are always rich in new business targets for you. The source for this is Exhibit Surveys, Inc. So your trade show booth represents your company culture. So think about how are you capturing those leads now when you're at the show. Well, you know, GJ, it's important how you capture leads at the show and off show. Because one of the key things that trade shows do is to reduce the cost of sales. That's the list. To make a face-to-face -face contact with a potential buyer, garnered from an ex exhibition costs only $215, compared to $1,039 for making that contact in the field, saving your organization a potential $824 on average. Now think about it, $824 per contact or per prospect and multiply it about all the people that you touch in a given year, that could be a huge savings reducing cost of sales through a trade show environment. Number six is building brand. 83% of exhibitors agree that building or expanding brand awareness is a high priority marketing related objective for trade shows. The next two objectives tied at 63%, new product promotions, launches, and the next brand awareness and reinforcement. The source for that is CEIR Changing Environment Study. We'll also sign up for our April 22nd webinar as we'll discuss more in detail how to use both verbal and visual communications to build your brand and better connect with your audience. And that audience right now includes five generations in the workplace, and we're going to teach you how to talk to each one of those. Thanks, Laura. That kind of leads us to number seven, connecting with vested attendees. In today's marketplace, Exhibition attendees are most likely paying their own way, and 76 come prepared with a specific business agenda. The average attendee spends 8.3 hours viewing trade show exhibits at a show or exhibition. Now that gives you plenty of opportunity to connect with your target audience. The source for this, again, is Exhibit Surveys, Inc. So we'll move on to number eight, leveling the playing field. Trade shows level the playing field. Booth space is generally inexpensive. The average cost is about $22.32 per square foot, and it's affordable for small or large companies. With appropriate trade show strategy and planning, paired with your creative marketing and booth design, small businesses can appear as substantial as larger corporations and generate that buzz on the trade show floor. Also, 46% of trade show attendees are now in executive or upper management. Now that's a lot of valuable attendees with top titles that are walking the trade show floor. They certainly have authority to make buying decisions. So if your main competitor exhibits every year at a significant trade show and you don't, those decisions may not include you. The source for those stats are the CEIR, the role and value of face-to-face. -face. So think of it this way. Where else can a new drink company position itself next to Coca-Cola and its products. Thanks, CJ. Now we come to number nine, researching the competition. Competitive intelligence is one of my areas of expertise and one of the things that I think is the most fun in marketing. Competitive intelligence, kind of think of it as spying legally without the chance of death. Truly, it is an opportunity, an ideal opportunity, to gain intelligence and secret shop all your competitors in one place. Maybe they'll even know who you are. That's great, because then they'll know you're checking them out and are taking current marketing activity into account in your planning, which makes you a much more formidable opponent. If they don't know who you are, you can secret shop their sales pitch and products and services and perform a mini strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, known as SWOT, on how you experience their company and its representatives. Because most likely, the experience that you had will be the experience that other prospective customers did as well. Then you can include this information in your competitive analysis and your own marketing and PR strategy when you get back to the office. Number 10, recruiting staff. This is truly one of the most overlooked and yet most powerful things you can do at a trade show. You can develop relationships with potential candidates long before you need them. You can use the trade show booth time to meet and get to know potential candidates as well as customers. You can encourage employees to gather business cards from and develop relationships with high potential possible employees. And don't stop with the employees alone. Tap all your networks at the trade show, from social, board, funder, and academic connections too. 
This will result in a large pool of candidates when you have a current position available. You can promote open positions at the trade show and interview potential new hires right there on the show floor without hiring a staffing company. Or even better, if you do decide to hire a staffing company as a partner, you can get a feel for the talent out there at the show and then give the staffing company a very clear idea of the candidate profile and skills inventory that you want to hire for a best fit with your company culture after you return from the trade show. If you've identified a few key candidates at a trade show, a recruiting company can also help you steal them away from their current employer. That also brings us to number 11, promoting a new industry concept. Thought leadership is a highly effective marketing and PR tool, and it has legs. If you and your company can be or are recognized as an authority in a specified in a specific or specialized field, that expertise is sought after and often rewarded. Presenting a revolutionary concept or new technology that can turn the industry on its ear at a trade show is a fast and efficient way to solicit feedback, gain supporters for your ideas, as well as get naysayer input. Now that's really important. In that way, if you get all the naysayers to give you all their barriers to why they don't believe in what you're saying, you can strengthen your message and overcome other barriers in the future. Think about this. If you pre present a revolutionary idea and a member of the press corps at the event itself catches wind of it, then hopefully you've created a press kit with the relevant information and placed it in the press room so that PR person or that press person can go get it for support for an article, then maybe they're blogging about it. Maybe they're tweeting about it. And then your thought leadership will be captured for the show and then broadcast out to the world. That's the power of a trade show. Number 12, building teams. You know, common experiences help create a certain esprit de corps within the trade show team. If you've been to a trade show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That camaraderie that is developed from the common experience can become legendary. If you've not attended a trade show, it's one of those you don't know what you don't know kind of things. There's something about being shoulder to shoulder from 7 a.m. through the evening activities, which can last into the wee hours of the morning, to build a bond. You can also build teams with customers, vendors, and suppliers. At a recent trade show, Tesco really kind of took this to the extreme. They decided to gamify a national vendor expo with an activity modeled after Monopoly. Using handheld devices, Buyers played Pepsiopoly by engaging with each supplier to learn about what they thought Pepsi's three key selling points were, without any guidance from PepsiCo. Then they swiped their devices on booth signs to earn money for their team. The handheld devices also served as an electronic business card and a virtual briefcase for buyers to store supplier collateral. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now you can go to this extreme, or you can create a more simple version to achieve the same result and goals for your marketing efforts. So thanks, Laura. You know, all four of those really build on to number 13 for training. You know, if you research a competition and recruit that staff and you're promoting that new industry concept and building those teams, isn't it really about building to get to that training moment? This is where you foster upper level product and company knowledge to prepare your people for the show. More often than not, exhibitors attend shows with booth staffers who don't even know what they're doing. And we know what happens then. They show it on their faces and their body language, and they're not prepared. Tell people why you're exhibiting, what you're exhibiting, what you expect of them on the trade show floor, and how to do what you expect of them. Have them set their own goals. But make sure they want to be there and they're excited to be there. Remember, this is a people business and that they enjoy interaction with other people. So prepare your booth staffers. In a nutshell, exhibit staff training is important because selling in a trade show or convention environment is much different than selling in other situations. Skills that work well on a daily basis don't work the same way at a trade show or other event. Even the most seasoned staffers can benefit from training that's focused on effective techniques that can help them succeed in this unique environment. Then we move on to number 14. That kind of goes with that stage of business we talked about earlier. Maybe you're in the last stage and you want to position a company for sale. Well, many times a company may want to exhibit at a trade show, conference, or event to attract those potential buyers to their company. What better way to get your company in front of volumes of attendees 
than at a trade show. It's even more valuable to have trained staff in your booth space with this type of knowledge if you're positioning the company for sale for better exposure and knowledge for the attendees. That brings us to 15, gaining retaining market share. 63% of sales and marketing managers strongly agree or agree that trade shows assist in gaining and retaining market share. It's amazing what people offer up freely at a trade show. Visit your competitor's booths. Collect their latest marketing material, including pricing. You can defend against competitive threats you otherwise may not have knowledge of. For example, let's say your chief competitor plans to launch a new software at a trade show that you're both attending. You know that they're doing this because they've submitted a multimedia release online through PR Web Free Show. Before you go to the show, you can already assess your competitor's strengths and weaknesses and incorporate that into your sales team pitches on the show floor. Well, we, uh, one example of this is with this competitive and retaining and gaining market share. I went to the Women's Wear Daily Show, um, the Magic Show. It's a mostly women's apparel, trade show, ex and accessories. And competitors were buying each other's clothing, analyzing it, deconstructing it, and then mimicking design or making improvements to their own, especially with things that were patent pending. You know, you can fairly assess and position your product or service against a competitor and ethically sway purchasing decisions in person to sign the deal today at a trade show with your company versus someone else. Number 16, testing a market. You can gain valuable customer and visitor insights into products under development or ready to market. Think of this as your free focus group. You can organize key customers to have an exclusive private showing of a new tech option for them to assess, co-create or purchase through a special event in a private meeting room or restaurant. Or you can be creative in your hands-on approach at the booth itself. Take photos of customers or potential customers interacting with your new product and post them to Pinterest or Instagram Live, or project them on a large plasma screen so they can have their 15 seconds of fame, which will draw more traffic to your booth when others see how much fun your people at the booth are having as motivation. The possibilities are endless. Think about the manpower and cost it would take to accomplish these things one-on-one -on -one or over the phone or in your office. I bet it would be a lot more at the than at the trade show, as we've already seen from the budget numbers. Thanks, Laura. So that brings us to number 17. This is creating media exposure. Isn't that what it's about? It's creating relationships, but also getting media. So maybe you want to build media relationships with industry press that can lead to valuable public relations, or research media to understand their interests and purpose at the trade show. Marketing and publicity can be also achieved, but through different media contacts. And maybe you want to secure face-to-face -face meetings with editors while on the trade show floor. Utilize trade shows to communicate how your company is evolving and what new things you bring to the industry. Consider what's newsworthy. Do you have a new product or service? Major company news of a merger or acquisition? Executive personnel changes or restructures? Maybe you have a new initiative that affects the industry. An award or recognition? a new distribution channel or partnership, or maybe new research results. All these things are newsworthy that you can get some more media attention while at the floor. So number eight, keynoting or conference speaking. This is where you can build your personal and corporate brand by sharing thought leadership or even sponsoring the show with a speaking opportunity. Being the perceived expert, it helps you establish yourself as an industry leader. It helps others learn more information. It helps you become a trusted resource. It gets you interviews and media coverage. You can gain access via conference and speaking invites. And you can convert followers to sales. I've done this many times since publishing two books. And I've even tied the books for building expertise in our industry to bring an exhibitor in. And it really gives added value to your company presence while you're at the trade show with all of your knowledge and bring your books with you. DJ, you know, that's really an important point because remaining up to date, whether you're an industry leader or not, is truly important. At trade shows, you can see the latest and greatest in your industry on display all in one place. If you want a high-speed education in real time, the trade show floor delivers. And you can also see the most up to date in terms of trade show displays themselves. From interactive touchscreen tablets to floor and ceiling projection screens, today's trade show floor is anything but boring. Sustainable exhibits, Integration of iPads and iPhones and integrated technology are all sure to grab your attention. One innovation that's been rewarded with high customer satisfaction in 2013 is a no-hassle zone designed right into the booth display. 
This is a place with information only and is guaranteed to have no salesperson involvement. While counterintuitive, attendees really appreciate this chance to look at info hassle-free. Then they seek out a salesperson once they're comfortable and armed with the knowledge they need to make a decision versus getting the elevator speech right up front. Number 20 is networking with vendors and our partners. You can meet with key vendor partners in one place to save time and expense for everyone. You can set up meetings with key vendors and partners prior to the show outside of exhibit hours so everyone can make sure and be on that floor. Cocktail parties and private meeting rooms can all be booked well in advance using the hotel or other site coordinators as resources. Here's a gem. Trade leads with other vendors. Why? If you have 1,800 leads and they have 1,800 leads, now you both have 3,600 leads. You know, it's just basic math, but it's a really powerful concept. These leads can become future prospects or partners, depending on how you morph your company and what your vision is. Be sure to attend our webinar on July 22nd, Notable Exhibiting Trends, Maximizing Your Visual and Verbal Communications. For more in-depth information on booth design trends, as well as networking and communication tips and techniques. So that brings us on to number 21. This is where you increase in knowledge. Staffers can attend workshops and educational sessions to learn new skills and remain relevant in your industry. This is particularly important if you're exhibiting in a trade show or event that exposes many people in the same industry to attend those workshops and classes to gain expertise, and it can aid you in becoming that trusted source for knowledge. Number 22, acquiring industry accreditation. Add a designation next to your name. Some industries even require it. How many of you have ever considered, considered even becoming a certified trade show marketer, also known as a CTSM, and become certified? If you're interested in learning more, check out www.exhibitor2014.com and read their career opportunity information to become accredited in the trade show industry. Are you a constant learner? Does your industry have an accredited program? You may want to consider that. So no matter what your industry, you may want to consider the importance of what your customer needs and how you can provide it with becoming that industry leader. So we move on to number 23. This is one of my favorites, building generational relationships. This is the connectivity plus the relationship plus the engagement divided by the five generations. So the depth and breadth of relationships matter more than ever as new generations bring their own unique experiences and perspectives to the workplace. A high percentage, which is 77% of qualified visitors, represent new customers. Remember, it's all about the relationships. Issues of race, gender, culture, culture, and sexual orientation have dominated the diversity arena for some time, leaving lurking in the darkness a difference that causes daily miscommunication and prevents untold numbers of relationships from being built, and that's the generational differences. The unsung element of difficulty, communication across generations, it's often fraught with assumptions, frustrations, and misunderstandings. Consider some mindset strategies. Maybe on your approach with generational differences, approach them with interest, not fear or negativity, and take interest in the interests of others. Take a learning orientation. The value of difference is that you can learn from each other. Be mindful of how your assumptions influence your interactions. And put yourself in their shoes. Do you know what another generational difference, what it's like in their day to day? Do you know what motivates them, excites them, gets them down, or how do they want to be treated? Empathize with their situation and needs and values. And you can do this sometimes directly by asking questions and taking an interest in their interests and directly by getting involved in some of the traditions and pastimes of another generation. So stay tuned for our July 22nd webinar to learn all about communication while on the show floor with the five generations in the workplace. Thanks, BJ. Now is the time to get a game plan together. Take your how-to guide and write down the 10 things that you'll do next with the knowledge that you gained today. Do you need some more education, like attending the next webinars in the series, or reading the noise behind business, how to make trade shows work? Do you need to get your trade show team together to talk about opportunities? Perhaps you need to get your key messages in order so that you're ready to design a new trade show collateral or a new booth display. Whatever you choose to do, 
Be sure that your trade show marketing and PR plan integrates with and supports your overall strategic plan. The next 15 minutes to half an hour will be our Q&A session. We'll be fielding questions through GoToMeeting questions, so please ask away. DJ and I will take as many questions as we can live. And we've been, I've been answering some, um, as people have been asking them, for some more simple things that don't require a lot of elaboration, like links or specific um, resources. So hopefully, if you guys um, are satisfied with those answers, great. If not, go ahead and post them again, perhaps in a different format. So DJ and I are going to take as many questions as we can live. Then you can reach us after the webinar, and we'll get you our contact info at the end of today's presentation. DJ, why don't you go ahead and get started? Thank you, Laura. And I do see we have answered those, so hopefully you can see them. I put up the link on there about the global research, uh, where to find the Master Trade Show list. I see Laura answered also about the slides being available. Some of the stats information I've answered on there also. So here's some more questions. It says, uh, oh, Laura, here's one for you. Oh, no, you already answered that, the webinar attendees about the PowerPoint presentation. I saw that. Um, are trade shows worth attending is the question. I'll answer that, Laura. So absolutely. There's no better value for your marketing dollar. In fact, trade shows are the premier source of buying information. And 50% of the leads at a show are closed without a sales call, like I said earlier. But 9% of those leads are closed usually with one sales call or another 17% with only two sales calls. So all in all, trade shows generate lead costs an amazing 45% less to close them than a field sale does. So think about that. That's smart money management. And there's also a greater opportunity to be brought up to date on the latest trends and developments. So think about uh, some trade shows like NAB in Las Vegas, for example. They're extremely busy and visually competitive. But industry-specific trade shows like Las Vegas are always well attended. So that's where you can gather those leads. Here's another question. How can we plan for success once we've taken care of the details before and during the trade show? Laura, I'll take that one. So after the show, you may want to rest, but this is when you need to make the most of your investment. The leads and contacts developed at the show need a personal letter and a phone call at the very least. So plan to distribute leads immediately after the show. Following up on the fruits of your labor after the show can make the difference in the world. Better yet, include a reminder of your exhibit's theme or some pleasant association of you in the exhibit. I have one here. Let's see. I think it is for Laura. It looks like a marketing question. Laura, here's one. I'm thinking about becoming a trade show speaker for a trade show. How long in advance do I need to be preparing, and what is the process? Thanks, DJ. Well, you know, that's very show specific. I'll give you an example of one that takes a long lead time. For example, the Society of Human Resources Management annual show happens every June. Now, a year and a half in advance, they are taking speaker applications. You have to go to their website, give them a profile so they can assess whether you're credible or not and have enough knowledge based on your speaking topic. Then they go through a panel who assesses everyone and then begins to award speaking opportunities. For that particular show, if you happen to have been an exhibitor, they also give you priority. So it depends on the show specifics. So it's worth it if you're thinking about this to go check the websites for the trade shows that you're interested in right now because they may have that long of a lead time. If you don't have any speaking material prepared, for example, start to think about speaker sheets, topics, and takeaways so that you can tell the show organizers, at least in high-level form, what information you'll be providing to attendees. And that's a great place to start. Thanks, Laura. Here's one that just came in. Where can we find the slideshows after? Laura, I'll let you handle that one. You'll be receiving a follow-up email with a link to the PDF URL for the presentation slides themselves. All right. Here's one. How can I fine-tune my sales and marketing message at the shows? Laura, I'll take a stab, and you might want to add on this, too. I would say um, an effective exhibit distinguishes you from your competition, and it's easy to identify by asking yourself a few simple questions. 
what do customers think is the most valuable quality about your competitor's products and service? What might induce them to switch to you? Is it specific product or service related? Maybe what are the main complaints customers have about your products or service and of your competitors' products or service? Maybe what do they see? Do they see you as a market leader? And if they do, why? Another one might be which customer needs to go unfulfilled? You know, do you have some, someone out there that is not your prospect? Or what is the key factor in your customer's buying decision? Or how are changes in your industry? Are they affecting you or your customers? You can find the right position of your company and products by answering those questions. Laura, do you have anything to add on that one? You know, I sure do, DJ. You know, key themes and messages for your company's marketing and advertising. If you haven't defined those before, those usually are defined within your trade show, excuse me, within your overall marketing and PR strategy for your company. Now, the key is, if you've developed taglines or key themes and messages, DJ, I'm going to let you to speak on this, is that your opportunity to get somebody's attention on the trade show floor is so brief that those key themes and messages have to be revised and edited down. DJ, I know you've got some pretty good information on this in terms of what, how many seconds you've got. Yeah, you know, when people are walking the trade show floor, you have three zones. And, and we cover this in another one, so I won't go into detail. The first zone is that are coming down the aisle, and they might be three booths away from you, and they happen to look over at you. That's where that 3.8 second attention getter attracts that audience. And that's about what is your emotional hot button? What's your unique selling proposition? Then when they go to zone two, that's where it's more detailed. You're answering or solving, answering a question or solving a problem. And then zone three is all about coming into your booth space. So, you know, if you're developing, a, if you're well-branded, put your company name first on your graphic and then put your unique selling proposition second. If you're not well-branded and, and you're a startup company or you're in a region and you're branching out and you're trying to expand your company vision and mission, I would probably do the unique selling proposition first and your company name second because people will be attracted to when you can answer their pain point or their questions. That's probably what I would say, Laura. Thanks, DJ. And if you guys, and if you guys need some more information on that, you can attend our July 22nd um, webinar on notable exhibiting trends, maximizing your visual and verbal communication. I'd like to go into the next question. We have a few more left. How much booth space will I need at a show? I'll take that one, Laura. Well, it's nice to have a large footprint, of course, on the trade show floor. But I, if you're new starting out or you're doing local shows, I'd probably start with a 10 by 10. And if your first show, with a simple booth presentation, and then maybe doing everything you can to capture the contact information and follow up with the leads after the show. I feel it's important about making those meaningful connections and conversations and the ability to convert those prospects to actual customers than the complexity of your booth. The way to look at it is if you can't have an impactful, impactful conversations with a single booth space, simply adding more real estate probably isn't the right solution. All right, here's another one, Laura. I think this one will go to you. Why do I need a trade show plan when I already have a marketing and PR plan for my company? Thanks, DJ. Well, a trade show plan is a very detailed step-by-step -step of what you need to prepare for this particular trade show. It helps you achieve the goals and objectives of your overall plan. But if you, especially if you've not attended a trade show before, there are very minute details that have to be handled sometimes years in advance to be able to attend a show. For example, if you don't have a booth display, that can take you know, between a couple of weeks to a couple of months, depending on the complexity to design. So that's my, overall, that's my overall answer to that, because there are so many people involved, and there's so many things that it touches from your exhibit company to the show managers to your exhibit packet, selecting a booth, all these things, and then designing the collateral and touching people pre, during, and post-show in terms of your marketing. Thanks, Laura. I just saw a new one come in. Um, it says, uh, the 20-plus recommendations are great, 
but might be overwhelming to incorporate all 20. What's the best way to select the most pertinent category to incorporate first, second, and so on? You know, great question. I would probably look at your overall company vision and mission. And I would think, you know, and, I, and I'm looking at number one and two, like are you introducing a new product and building a distribution? I would focus on those two if that's important to your company. You know, maybe it's not important for you to go out there and talk about the media yet. Maybe you're getting that brand out. You know, and I also believe in competitive intelligence. I wrote about that in my first book, Full Brain Marketing, also. You need to know if you're introducing a new product and building distribution, you know, who's your niche audience, who are your competitors, and make sure you do your research. And then when you're researching the trade shows in that global event, focus on those two only, because you're right. Focusing on all 23 is overwhelming. These are just ideas. You know, to me, facilitating number three and nurturing those relationships and generating qualified leads kind of still ties in with number one and two. So what you do is it's kind of like when you're doing a marketing plan or a show plan, you look at your main focus. So say we're introducing new products and we're building distribution. That's our vision. That's our objective. But now we're going to hone down and do some tertiary things and saying, well, okay, out of that, we want to facilitate and nurture relationships. We want to generate qualified leads. So now I'm doing the bullet points that support those two objectives. You know, reducing cost of sales, that may not be a focus, but building brand may be, because that can still tie in to introducing new products. Um, connecting with vested attendees, that still kind of overlays with me with building those relationships and generating qualified leads. So I'm thinking if we can take all 23, pick the top three, and figure out which ones kind of go in there, like your, like your SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You know, take those 23 ideas, set up your primary one, two, or three, and which ones fall underneath the main category that you can focus on. That's probably how I'd answer that one. So let's go on. I see another one. How am I going to measure my attendance and presence at the show? Well, I'll take that one, Laura. In addition to counting leads, it's important to measure marketing impressions at the show. Just like you can see how many people view an ad in a magazine, you might want to know how many people are viewing your marketing materials, like signage, while on the show floor. So I'd suggest that you work with the show organizer to get the numbers. For example, if your signage is at the front of an entrance on the east side of the building, find out how many people entered the show floor from that door. This can help you plan for future shows and decide whether they're even worth attending. Let's see, I see another question. Laura, I think this one's for you. Sales and marketing distinctly separate at our company. Why do they need to work together, as you say, at trade shows? Well, oftentimes, DJ, marketing plans incorporate sales goals as well as sales goals incorporate marketing plans. But people don't necessarily operate that way and don't necessarily communicate. So if you think about it, if your sales team, and we saw some of these things numbers in the polls, um, if your sales team is actually manning the floor, but your marketing team is actually creating or help to, helping to create your trade show booth and your collateral material, sales and marketing need to talk to make sure that those pieces effectively help the sales folks. And if they're not effectively helping the sales folks, then they're not doing their job. And vice versa, if the sales folks aren't using the key themes and messages that marketing is determined that appeal to your target audiences, then they're not going to be effective also. So it really takes hold, and that's just a very simple example. All right, I see one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, do I have a post-show plan, or do I need a post-show plan? I'll start on that, Laura, and you might want to add on it. It takes a lot of money to plan an exhibit at a show. So don't let all your effort go to the wayside, but not be inactive after the event's over. You know, in this competitive world, if you don't respond to those leads within two or three days, and I would even say faster if you buy an app at a, at a show and you're doing it on the show floor. And that will be covered later on in some more webinars. But I recommend having a sound plan for your follow-up process with the people immediately after the show's over. Uh, if you have an app where you can send out information in real time at the event, even better. If you wait two or three weeks, you've missed your window. Laura, do you want to add anything on that last question? No, DJ, I think you pretty much covered it. 
All right. Well, let's move on to the next slide. So Laura and I would like to make an offer. If you need anything after this webinar and when you get the slides and you find you have some more questions, we have some consulting services that would include, do you want us to review your trade show plan and make recommendations? Maybe you want a new trade show plan where you need help getting started or trade show consulting services. Also, we're offering a discount on design and print business collateral and on trade show tangible items for the next 30 days on those two that expires on February 21st. So play, take advantage. You know, we're here as the experts to help you become the expert. Thanks, DJ. We also offer additional services. You know, in our experience, we've found that small, medium, and large companies, it really doesn't matter what size you are. We have found that people are not necessarily doing overall strategic planning for businesses. And, and that's really important. How do you know how your trade show plan is going to fit in if you've not decided what your overall plan is for the business? We can help with overall strategic planning, overall marketing and PR strategy, as well as marketing and PR planning for your overall business. We also do copywriting for trade show collateral or public relations and we do media, PR, distribution, and follow-up. As with any trade show planning you do, we encourage you to make sure it fits into overall business and marketing PR strategies to help meet those goals and objectives so everybody's happy and successful. We also offer some additional resources to help make sure that happens. Sales training resources. As we've talked about, sales training for the exhibit floor is very different than regular sales training, and we know that. Ask us if you need some help with that. We partner with nationally recognized experts to make sure your trade show sales are more effective. Our sales expert for this web series is Alice Hyman. In terms of specialty items, ask us. Our vendors are on the cutting edge, including the latest and desired green promotions. Our specialty partner for this web series is OCG Creative. Be sure to contact us with your specific needs in these areas, and we'll introduce you as an attendee to our vendors so they know you've had this webinar experience, that you're armed with the knowledge, and are ready to go to change up your marketing at the exhibit floor. Thanks, Laura. And that leads us to here's our contact information. And we'd also like to recognize and thank each of you for being on the webinar today, but especially our webinar sponsor, Nomadic Display. They're the world's leading producer of high-quality custom modular and portable trade show displays. So why trade show marketing? Again, because innovation is a contact sport. Our other trainings are held on April 22nd, Selecting the Right Show, How Due Diligence Pays Off, July 22nd, Notable Exhibiting Trends, Maximizing Your Visual and Verbal Communications, and October 21st, Making the Most of Your Trade Show Presence, How to Tie the Ribbon Around the Package. You'll be receiving a follow-up email with an attendee survey. We'd appreciate your time in giving us feedback so we can continue to, pro to provide you with online education to meet your needs. The email will also include a reminder about how to download your ebook copy of The Noise Behind Business, How to Make Trade Shows Work. Or if you choose the hard copy version, um, we can also mail that plus shipping. We'll send a special link to get you at a discounted 50% off the hard copy book and plus shipping added. So that's all we have time for today. We'd love to hear from you, how you've integrated, what you've learned, and especially in the future about how you've applied it to better your business. We wish you all the best. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.